Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Welcome to the webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Bob Wentz and I shall be the moderator for the webinar. 
The webinar is entitled Improving Sewage Pumping Station Reliability, and it will be presented by Andy Wilson of Hydrostal. There will be a short time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, but please note the presenter's details will be shown during the Q&A session. So should you wish to contact them for further information, uh, please do so. During the webinar, please post your questions using the Q&A button in Teams. And at the end of the webinar, I've put up a slide showing details of the next webinars to be shown after this uh, session. So thanks very much indeed, everyone. I'd now like to hand over to you, Andy. Andy, I think your microphone is muted. Thank you, Bob. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you now. Thanks, Andy. Cheers, man. Afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, breakout session on improving sewage pumping station reliability. I'm Andy Wilson, a business development manager with Hydrostol. I've been working for uh, 11 years. Prior to that, I was in the Grunfoss business, and before that, I started out as an irrigation engineer. So what we're going to do in this short session is cover the main elements that underpin reliable and resilient sewage pump station design. And this helps to reduce pump blockage, maintenance and energy. And a failure to follow some or all of these points um, can result in increased blockage, increased energy consumption and expensive reactive maintenance. The talks framed around the pump centre's concise sewage pump station design guide. This guide is, as you can see on the screen, uh, on a double sided sheet of A4 to keep things concise and simple. It's available for free download from the pump centre website. And whilst the session covers a lot of the key fundamentals that can help towards reducing blockage and maintenance and saving energy, some further reading um, would be. Uh, the pump centers pumping systems design guide or perhaps the hydraulic institute ANSI 9.8 pump intake design guide so pump blockage and efficiency what are the type of things which increase sewage pump blockage well poor wet well and poor pipework design can can be a factor as can the control philosophy and the actual selection of the pump. And finally, having a zero maintenance um, culture or regime and no emphasis on hydraulic efficiency restore. And when it comes to reducing pump efficiency, the types of things that affect that are partial pump blockages, air entrainment, uncontrolled vorticity and flow jetting, no maintenance, again or an or hydraulic efficiency restoring going on so if we look at the wet well inlet design well high level free cascading inlet flows near to pumps can cause a high level of air entrainment and it's important to note that um, three to five percent air entrainment can actually reduce the published efficiencies and flows of pumps by as much as 10 to 15 percent Another important thing to note, though, is air entrainment efficiency losses um, during a short duration when you're cleaning a sump far outweigh or far outweighed by the larger energy savings that you can realise through um, sustained reduction of pump blockage that low level operation and pump cleaning, sump cleaning can can give. If we look at the inlet design, um, ideally the inlet should be at a low level. Uh, pretty central and square onto the pumps. This reduces something known as um, bulk rotation. You can see the picture here, the arrow where you've got a mass rotation, bulk rotation in a wet well. If this happens or occurs, contrary to the uh, rotating direction of the pump, you will reduce the performance of the pump quite significantly. 
the, the other thing about the inlet is obviously we said before avoid cascading so if you put a drop pipe down here that will take away a lot of the uh, velocity generated through the gravity fall and again you see here section AA central section BB square onto the two pumps so all this helps reduce air entrainment and jetting If we look at um, baffles, where because you can't always put a drop pipe in, it might not be possible. So then at least put a single baffle. And in a larger pumping station, that might have multiple inlets. So then you need to have something called a baffle wall. This one here on a plan view and a, and a profile view. And these baffle walls have um, square slots typically. Um, to accept flow and each slot should be the size um, to take at least a nominal flow of one pump per slot. And the flow again should be square onto the pumps. But if in doubt, then it pays dividends to conduct a model test. Wet well benching, basically the flat floor area underneath the pump intake should be and, and within the wider pumping station for that matter, it should be minimal. So that's this part here where it sort of funnels down. Your stop level, ideally, you want to be quite low and have a minimum residual volume there. The surrounding sides should be benched uh, 45 to 60 degrees. The rougher the surface, the steeper the bench. So concrete would work better with a 60 degree bench. Plastic probably 45 degrees. And the smaller the pump station's residual volume is at this stop level, at this low level stop, the better the removal of your floating, suspended, settled and um, solids. So during the cleaning cycles. So one thing to really avoid is ex excessively large, wide, flat bottom sumps as you've got no transverse velocity to do any cleaning. So things will build up. If we look at benching again, a poor example here of poor design, flat floor, high stop and start levels. So sedimentation will build up during dry weather flows. And when you get a, a plug flow from a storm or uh, a, a peak in, in, in flow, it will tend to push and drift that pile towards a pump intake, increasing the chances of blockage. An improved design is, as we saw before, a good steep bench, minimal retain volume here. So that's using sort of gravity to migrate the um, debris towards the intake of the machine and help keep the pumping station in a self cleaning situation. We'll look at talk about uh, vorticity now. Um, Hydraulic Institute classifies vortexes in six different types. As you can see here from a surface dimple to a full air core. Um, and free surface vortexes can cause air entrainment, particularly from type four upwards. So it's something you really do need to design out. Sometimes you have to model a station to actually ensure you're designing out um, surface vortices. There are exceptions, as there often are in wastewater. There seem to be few complete absolutes in the wastewater game. Um, exceptions would be like low level um, cleaning of a pumping station where the pump might may perhaps snore so you will get some air entrainment and also our own hydrostore pre row system that actually utilizes a proven sump geometry to take control of um, type 3 and type 4 vortexing to regularly pull um, floating oils and fats and trash into the pump and therefore out of the pumping station there are other types of um, vorticity as well, which can be generated below the level, so subsurface vorticity. Um, these can often have a swirling action, and the effect of that can be to um, almost weave or bind um, rags and things into rope, which can cause a problem to pump impellers. So we'll move on to the actual pipe work within the station. Um, recommended velocities 
low velocity systems are great for saving energy, but they're also magnificent at blocking pumps up and pipelines. So suction pipes minimum of 0.7, maximum of 1.5 meter a second. On your verticals, you really want a, at least 1.5 meters a second going up that vertical riser in, in a wet well. Um, it shouldn't need to go over two and a half meters a second. Uh, horizontal can be lower, could be 0.7, um, but probably better to be one, 1 1.2. And valves 0.7 to about uh, 3.5. Um, so it, it's kind of important to consider um, the utilization times at different flows so that you can kind of design your system so that you have good self cleanse velocity for the majority of the time, particularly in the actual pumping station, getting the stuff out of the station. So you, you really want to try to maintain a vertical pipe velocity of at least 1.5 meters a second when you're bringing the level down towards the cleaning cycle. How do you work out the velocity? Well, there's lookup tables. You can do things on your laptops, but I've never gone away from having a slide rule at hand. And um, you can see here for a given flow, uh, 10 litres a second, you'll have an alignment with different sizes of pipe, 350 mil there, 0 0.1 metres a second, way too low. So if I went to a 250 mil, 0.2, but you can see I've got to go a long way up that scale to get that velocity up to 1.5. So a much, much smaller pipe. Very quick, very simple. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I, I tend not to be without a slide wheel somewhere. Or you can calculate it. Velocity is flow divided by area. Let's look at the control philosophy now. Um, level control should be such that the normal stop level is low enough to affect a sump clean pretty much on every every drawdown cycle. So um, that's operating down here in this sort of region. That's when you get your cleaning. An alternative might be to program low level cleaning cycles. Um, different manufacturers have different recommendations, so it's, it's worth speaking to the manufacturer of, of the equipment for the pump. But you must remember that the majority of well cleaning does take place at the lowest levels and whilst this means higher static head, higher energy, the, the benefits of keeping the station clean, keeping the pumps from clogging can often outweigh um, some little bit of energy loss sometimes. So cleaner wet wells mean less pump blockage, higher average efficiency pumping operation. So um, something to definitely try to get right. Another thing here on control philosophy, uh, which we've covered a little bit, avoid excessive steady state conditions, um, holding the station at high levels with bad geometry is going to end up with a poor result. And avoid extended periods of operation at the high level. So as I've just said earlier, both of those scenarios are often used to try and save energy, but there's always a payback. You don't get something for nothing in this world. You might save the energy, but you're going to turn your sump into a settlement tank. You'll probably block your pumps more, so then you'll lose energy. So, you know, as I say, it's, it's a balancing act, as is most things in life. Ensure there is a regular um, duty rotation as well. So um, that just minimizes any buildup of debris in one side of the sump compared to the other. Example of um, blockage control uh, of uh, blockage control philosophy, as I call it, would be electrical tariff management. So during peak hours, five o'clock to say seven o'clock, um, some some people will think, well, I, I'm going to raise the level, pump less, reduce the static, but that comes at a price. You're probably going to block the pumps more. Proportional level control. Uh, well, reducing speed as um, level falls, reduces velocity. Uh, can redu that can end up with increasing the chances of blocking the pump. It's uh, lower speed, it's less velocity and energy inside the pump. It increases the probability of clogging it. And 
half nominal speed, the available impeller energy to prevent clogging drops by about 75%. So for these kind of reasons, it's no surprise that most variable speed drive manufacturers now incorporate countermeasures to help offset some of the negative aspects of a more advanced control philosophy. Right, poor pump selection. So the highest utilization um, duty points uh, need to occur uh, between about 80 and 105 percent of this best efficiency flow point. Uh, you can stretch that to 70 to say, 120. Um, but you really speak to your pump manufacturers because most pump manufacturers will will have a view on that on that particular aspect. And any operating points outside of the range should only be short duration transient periods and not um, fixed duties. So the type of thing that might happen at a startup or a shutdown. And following these rules will improve the pump's reliability and reduce the probability of blockage and maximize efficiency. I think it's important to remember that big flow turndowns equal reliability turndown. So you can see all the things that can go wrong, overheating, bearing life, cavitation at the other end. These kind of things happen when you're trying to stretch the um, field of operation a bit too wide. The turndown is too large. The reliability will go down. Also on pump selection, it's really important to understand the system curve. Uh, this is vital. Uh, flow rate is usually an estimate in wastewater, so obsessing over two decimal places on the flow uh, may not yield good results, whereas obsessing a bit on the static head, which is a measurable and a true foundation of a system curve, can give you much better results. So a duty point, typically a flow, a static head and a dynamic head. So it looks something like this. And graphically, there's your static head element. Your dynamic head element is this curvy bit, the bit that stands above. So that would be your 20 meters. That could be your seven. And this graph shows the different flows a specific system will allow the pump to deliver against, regardless of what you do with the variable speed drive. Um, and the amount of flow you can get from a pump at a given speed depends on where it intersects the system curve. So the system curve is the track the pump rides on, in the words of Bob Went. Um, so good pump selection may look something like this, where you've got a minimum, a maximum and an average. So you've got something to frame it by there. Single duty points are only safe if the static head doesn't vary. Normally in a wastewater system, you're going to have a minimum and a maximum there somewhere. So a poor pump selection using the same pump uh, could look like this. And what's happened here is the static elements have moved um, the maximum static and the minimum. So now we've got a much wider track, almost too wide for our pump to to run on. So this is a more unstable um, system. So appropriate pump selection, which is the final one here. Understanding the properties of the pump media, you know, what are you pumping? Is it high rag? Is it high grit? Is it saline? Is it abrasive? Is it sludge? Are there flocculants that are fragile? So you really need to think about what you're pumping and what the best machine is going to be to handle that and ensure the pump is constructed from the right materials and you've got the right geometry uh, for the application. And yet yeah, right pump right application, very important. So are all sewage pumps really the same? Well, some people want to try and say that and commoditize it, but I don't believe you can really do that sensibly. There are many different pump impeller designs and they're all there for a reason. All sewage pumps aren't the same and should not be treated as a commodity. Uh, each has its own strengths and weaknesses and no single design fits all applications. It's important to have a choice and use the correct pump in the correct system or application. And some of the key aspects of 
uh, impeller design are things like uh, the, obviously the free passage um, or the uh, the amount of shear that the impeller imparts on on a pump liquid um, and also things like the the uh, ability of the pump impeller or to to sustain efficiency in an aggressive environment like wastewater that becomes very important so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play an animated summary of what I've just spoken about and then we'll go to the to the questions. It says. Oh, hang on, I know what's going on here. We've got to get rid of the laser pen. And then we can play it.
Well, thank you. And I think I'll pass over to Bob now. I think we're into the, the question time. Uh, we are, Andy, yes. And uh, I think we've got time for one, possibly maybe two questions. The first one is uh, on slide 15, you refer to VSD manufacturer countermeasures. Yeah. Could you please elaborate a little on that? Um, yes, I think uh, the countermeasures tend to be um, geared towards putting energy uh, back into the system. Uh, if if you're using a variable speed drive to slow things down and take energy out, then you need to at some point put some energy back in and either speed the pump up, reverse the pump um, and do things to try and um, agitate and move the wastewater um, through through the pumping station to try and unblock the pump if it's become block, blocked and, and that type of thing. Uh, those are the main sort of countermeasures that, that a lot of drives have built into them now, like, like wet well cleaning cycles or, or pump pump cleaning cycles. OK, thanks very much indeed, Andy. Um, the next question, Andy, is, uh, is there a link to the pumping stations design guide? And I think I can probably answer that uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I'll let you um, take that one, Bob. Yeah. Yep. Uh, which is that please contact the pump centre for a copy of that. It is under review at the moment and a new version will be published um, fairly soon. So uh, uh, hopefully that will be coming out uh, fairly soon. It's under review, but if you'd like a copy of the current version, please uh, contact the pump centre direct. OK, um, do we have chance? Yeah, just one more question very quickly, uh, Andy, from Simon Watley. Have you got data where you have compared Proroclean to other improved pumping techniques? Um, as a direct comparison, um, uh, yes, but it, it probably only on call outs uh, in terms of reactive maintenance, reduced the amount of reactive maintenance. In terms of energy comparisons, uh, we've done it theoretically, uh, but um, yeah, the only hard sort of facts we could give you would probably be reduction of call outs. OK, thanks very much indeed, Andy. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to uh, go over to uh, a final couple of uh, points now, if I may. And um, the first thing I'd like to say is thank you very much indeed, Andy, for um, the presentation. That was really good. And also thank you to everybody out there for attending. Um, the next slide I'm going to put up will have details of the following two sessions and hopefully you can make them. Uh, but otherwise, thanks for indeed uh, everyone for attending and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you.